So the aim of the, the panel discussion, well, should we wait for everybody to finish getting their stuff together? Um, so do you have yourselves sort of mentally organized for, for this debate? Did you do as requested and come up with some questions? Yeah, okay. Um, and uh, there was one, one fellow who wanted to ask a question. We could fit that in now, especially. It would be a great time. I'll give you the mic that I have. Thank you. Uh, I was really interested in, in uh, how to somehow translate emotions, human emotions, to, to machines, computer, or, or um, computable uh, interfaces. And uh, from the presentation, I gathered that there were you kind of grouped the emotions as just positive or negative. Did you research something or did you look into some more specific emotions or was that the five? Yeah, just to elaborate on that, please. Yes, uh, is this audible, right? Definitely emotions are more than just positive or negative. And uh, um, I tried to get to that with the panic versus frustration example. So clearly there is more to distress than just it being a negative emotion because frustration is also a negative emotion. But the difference here is in the abilities or the power that you have on the consequences of the situation. You get frustrated if you know that you're able to solve this problem but it will impact you negatively. For example, it'll eat your time um, or it'll be just like annoying task to do to solve the problem. But if you are not able to predict in the future, so it'll be very uncertain, but you are fairly certain that it's going to be something negative, you're not going to be able to overcome this problem, you're going to miss the deadline. Uh, so that's content into the negativeness of these two emotions. Continuing with the same subject, uh, do you feel like it would be interesting if uh, an um, AI program could be frustrated because it wouldn't know what to do next? Yes, uh, especially if this frustration serves a function, if it's not just an epiphenomenon that now it's frustrated, but if that frustration actually prepares the agent to somehow cope with the situation. For example, it has been proposed that the function, one of the functions of frustration is that it increases the exploratory noise of the agent, uh, which encourages seeking different ways out of this frustrating situation. All right, I hope that we've got coffee now and uh, we go on to the, the full group of speakers discussion. So, uh, so I'm not jumping around too much, I'll sit down. But um, the idea here today is um, that we have, uh, the whole event is, is aimed to, to kind of uh, share and discuss and debate and um, the discussion therefore the panel the aim here is that each of the speakers has presented something about their own work and um, either implicitly or explicitly made some kind of a, a proposal or a proposition that is uh, uh, the basis of their their work this is um, in a sense the science of it they have to be proposing something new in order for be do, to be doing science so um, I have asked then each of them to th try and think of um, one of the other's work uh, uh, which they would be interested in um, or which they might disagree with and, uh, and sort of um, discuss and debate that. Um, I was sort of semi-inspired by um, being at this con computational cognitive neuroscience conference in Berlin where um, they had a keynote debate between Carl Friston and Jeff Beck discussing this free energy minimization principle. And um, the, the, the inspiration was in a sense negative because they couldn't manage to make a debate. So, okay, it's very interesting stuff and I learned something about the, um, the principle, uh, which I promptly forgot. But, um, but they, as a value for money for the scientific audience, there wasn't much um, because there wasn't a possibility to make a proposition from this principle they had to agree that it's simply a framework for, um, for working, it's not a theory. It doesn't propose something which you can then either support or attack or falsify or, or not. So um, 
I would like to have something concrete that we can discuss, and I hope that I, I expect that uh, the, the speakers have got something concrete. So I want to start with Otto Lappi, and you have the chance now to, to level your... Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll present my question or comment or whatever to you. See, let's see if we can get debate or not. My, my worry when Ben uh, presented this idea that you, you say that, okay, I disagree with what you said and, and it could be extended is that everybody will just agree, well, I disagree with myself as well and yes, it could be extended. And, but let, let's see, maybe, maybe we can get something. So uh, you had very nice examples, uh, the, the storyline with the, with the famous uh, snake and then the fast response and then the, uh, the uh, cascade of, of different responses uh, first. The, stimulus is present there and in input is coming along and then you get presumably from long-term memory the information about the kids the previous day and then that, that then modulates the emotional uh, response. So uh, one thing that I noticed, uh, primed by my, my own, own, own thing, thinking just five minutes earlier, was that, uh, that there seemed to be a bit uh, from the behavior missing. So if I think about uh, the case of the snake and the snake is over there, so it's, it's, I, I, the snake arrives but it's in space it's over there on, on, on the ground pr presumably. So what, what happens, uh, so, something is en encoded on the retina, it shoots up in, into the uh, amygdala presumably, there's this danger, Will Robinson danger response and then, th then what happens I think is that it shoots ne next to the midbrain, to the superior colliculus, which is where eye movements are programmed, and you will immediately fixate the snake, while all, all the while the cerebral cortex is thinking, hmm, I wonder what's going on here, and then, then those slower processes come. So the upshot is uh, the active sampling of the en environment is at the same time scale as the responses you were describing, and you kind of left that out. So. If, if I was not able to look at the snake, that would probably quite a lot affect the way I feel. So maybe there's a snake there, my brain is alerted, but I can't look at it. So that uncertainty will cer certainly shoot up the stress level. Whereas then if you had the e experiment, there's a fixation cross and then the spider, icky or not, is pro 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 presumably presented foveally on, on the screen where they are looking at. So this, this um, uh, how, how to fit active sampling into your story? Yes, I agree with everything. Um, so there's no debate here. Uh, so yes, I left that out, that's true. Um, but if you remember the first emoji there, uh, that was a scientifically accurate depiction of surprise. Uh, you have large eyes, uh, eyebrows heightened, maybe mouth is open in order to uh, facilitate uh, higher uh, oxygen intake. Uh, so obviously these are preparations that the emotional system uh, partakes in in order to facilitate this uh, type of uh, additional uh, recovery of information from the environment. So definitely this is an active interaction with the environment. Do you have any other opinions from the others? How does active sampling fit in when what you have been proposing, the three who haven't talked yet, is, has um, been uh, constrained, tightly constrained to your kind of uh, sequential presentation, uh, experimental paradigms. So how does active sampling, in, which is you know, where you need to go if you want to deal with the natural brain, fit in with what you've been doing? Um, Tuka as naturalistic stimuli, presented in a non-naturalistic way. So how do, you th how do you see that? Well, well, I look at it from the computational perspective a bit. So it's, we can definitely see it in the data that, that hu when humans respond to natural data, they, they do sample, uh, they, they do attend naturally and concentrate, of course, on, on, on the information that's important for, for completing the task. But I think it's also um, uh, the computational problem in a sense that, that 
if, if we try to understand uh, which uh, stimuli actually help us to solve the task, we can do simulations, for example, that, that try to solve a, 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 a sequential optimization task, selecting information sequentially from the input and see if that provides a better outcome uh, than, than just following what the user actually did. So I think there are several, several ways of looking at this, uh, this problem. It's, it's, it's definitely the, from, the, from the behavioral side of the user when you, when you set out the natural task, but also you can build a model that tries to explain this uh, from the data yeah. afterwards, just, just by trying to sample information from what actually happened, but in a more optimal way to see if, if that matches what, uh, what the uh, recorded data shows. Lowry. Yeah, just to continue from that, but on a little different way. Um, so this active sensing thing, although we are now talking about it as a, um, say, a human feature, um, but we've started thinking to apply that to studying the brain function um, by doing so-called closed-loop experiments, so that we have um, the, the brain activity to influence the kind of stimulation that we provide to the person and then by doing that, so we can converge faster to uh, the effect that we want to study. So that's not uh, the active sensing of the person, but of the experimental design or experimental setup. So it's probably pretty effective there too. It's a bit like Tuka's experiment, but just applied to, uh, to a different question. Yeah, yeah. and, and this, is, this is what we've been trying out also to, to set up, for example, a Bayesian optimization on, on selecting the stimuli data that we use to train the models. Mm -hmm. So then, then basically the model seeks for an optimal evidence in order to, to see if, if, if that's what explains the output. So it's, right. I think it's a very similar idea. Yeah. We have also um, pressimo questions, but uh, if one of you have another pressing kind of uh, point that you want to make onto the other guys, then we'll go with that first. Okay, well, I can ask two. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the very cool stuff that you're doing. Um, just one thing that um, I shouldn't say that it bothers me, but just what I'm interested in in, in your work. So now these uh, EEG responses that you are using for, for guiding the uh, uh, say changes in the in the stimuli and the optimization in some sense. Um, so how much prior knowledge you have to put in there uh, to be after the right kind of response? Because I'm mean, just making a thought experiment. If uh, your your setup uh, taps on responses from some early visual regions, you will probably optimize to a face stimulus which has the highest contrast, for example, which is totally unrelated to what you're after now. So. So how much of that kind of information you have to put into the system beforehand? So, so actually, we're, we're training personalized models, of course, for, for every yeah. individual. So, so there are personal differences, and then there are task differences, I believe. But what we've done, it, it seems that there is some sort of an... Um, well, we, we've been called it internally a relevance effect that, that we can see. So, uh, which, which can be there independently of the task, which can then be used to, to first classify things that are important, and then, then maybe we find some fun, finer grained details from the signal that, that can actually be used uh, um, for, for the opt optimizing the, the actual movement in the, in the latent space, in the gun space, for example. Okay, so it's like we're having a pre-training which tells the system that which parts are to be considered as noise or interference. Yeah, but, but the so experiments the other... that I showed here, it's just, the, the model just learns it independent. We, we just feed in time windows. Yeah. I, I think the more, even, even more important question than, than that is uh, what we've been trying now for, for a while, haven't been very successful yet, but, uh, but hope to be soon, is, is an unsupervised uh, approach. So now what you do is you, you see examples of positive and negative responses and then you train some model. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how supervised machine learning works. But now, now the idea is that, that because we see different 
for example, different types of phases, and uh, maybe we can unsupervisedly separate two groups of signals, the, the uninteresting ones and the interesting ones. I think that's, that's even more interesting to, to see whether, whether, whether we can unsupervisedly discover the features and then possibly even to associate them with the, with the latent models. So then, then the machine could, without showing any examples, it could discover which features in the, in the space are the ones that the user is after. So we could, we could actually show information to the user and then as an output the model would say, for example, that I think you're paying attention to the hair. So yeah. without any pre-training. I, I can comment on that. Uh, that that's actually a huge uh, conceptual problem if you want to understand natural world behavior. So how do you actually describe the real world? Let's say I, I'm studying driving. I can show you all a picture of the road and because you have a human brain, you can see a road there and you immediately know what one does with a road. However, this is not the description uh, that, that the uh, model sees. It's just a bunch of num numbers. So where in that are the features that are the relevant features for control and behavior and what to sample, how, how to define uh, the alternative features that could be sam sampled. So, uh, so in, in the model that we showed, we were able to cheat, I'm afraid to say, because we were building on the road uh, traffic engineering models. So we could just take those features which engineers have been using in their uh, feedback control models, pure feed, feed, feedback control, and we could use that as the description of the road environment and then have our more cognitive model observe the same things. But that doesn't, of course, apply in general, if you, if you want to understand other behaviors or even other drive, driving behaviors, and that's that's where really the the biggest uh, bi biggest problem uh, lies. Marian, would you like to divert us to a new course? <laughs> now, there's one thought come to mind when I listen to this. Uh, this is this is exactly why we use simple stimuli. We use simple stimuli because the uh, so we have a tightly controlled environment, and then I listen to people and I, and I I greatly respect people who who dare to try naturalistic stimuli, but then it it, well, it makes me smile a bit when then the first complaint is yeah but now we don't have any control anymore because now the stimulus is so complicated and we don't know how to represent it, and I thought yeah that's exactly why <laughs> that that's exactly the problem and that's why we use the simplified stimuli, although we all like to go to the naturalistic ones. Um, can I suggest a halfway meeting point wherein we use models to help the planning of experiments in a bit more complicated and naturalistic way. And these models help us um, to understand the then more noisy data. For example, in your case, you're dealing with uh, sensory, stim uh, sensory input from, from the scalp. And if you were studying emotion and doing machine learning of trying to infer the emotion uh, from the sensory input from the scalp or output, um, there would it be possible that, for example, my types of models that try to generate the same emotion in that participant, but computationally would help the inference process. So it would be a heavy bias on your uh, modeling. It would be a theoretical bias. And I, I think that the, what cognitive science can give us are these types of heavy biases that we then use to make sense of data. And when we have a heavy bias such as a um, cognitive model of the, uh, of the uh, person in the experiment, we can make the experiment incrementally more naturalistic, more complicated. Yeah, I, I also believe that, that uh, if you model the stimulus space, then you can compute distances, for example, between stimuli. Because now, many times, these experimentations are, are based on simply someone selecting two classes and then assuming that the difference is there. But do we really know that, that these classes represent what we're studying? 
So if, if, you have a, if you have a model that actually explains the distances between stimuli, then you're able to, to first do better sampling and, and second explain better what, what your findings are actually targeting. Yeah, I do agree. I think there's just a danger that we should acknowledge in, in modeling the complex naturalistic stimuli. And that is that if we try to bridge from the, uh, say, deconstruction or decomposition of the stimulus as seen by the model um, to the decomposition that the brain will do to it or the abstraction. So this might be the same or it may not be the same. And, and occasionally uh, we might do incorrect inter interpretation of the brain data or which is a bit safer, we just don't find anything because there is no part in the brain that reacts in the same way as our model predictions are, are telling. But, I mean, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that, it's just that we need to be careful. We can go to um, some of these Bresimo questions as well. Um, perhaps something a bit more lightweight to start off with, so biases in AI research, has anybody got an opinion on that? We have an all-male panel today, I admit that, I acknowledge that, I, mea culpa, mea culpa maxima. That was because I had a theme in mind which was um, to do something empirically based, drawing together um, computation and brain science, and I didn't know enough people, uh, enough uh, females doing, doing this work in Helsinki, and that's just my own um, lack. Uh, although I think that there is a bias existing in the, in, in the faculty um, but uh, next time we do this seminar, we'll have um, a more balanced panel because the, the, I know more people who are doing uh, different types of work. Um, uh, one of the reasons was also that I, I wasn't sure if I could get some of the people that I know who are doing this type of work because they're um, professors and you know, I've never met them before and I didn't know if they would come. So I asked people I knew, but what do you think who are working in those um, faculties? Uh, about the, the, this issue, bias in, in, in AI research. Maybe that the, the question should be broadened to like bias in, in uh, human computational neuroscience research. Although uh, I, I would say in your defense here that uh, there's two biases we have to keep in mind whenever th this kind of thing comes up. So one is gender bias, which I don't know, maybe implied here, and the other is sampling bias. So we only have right now a sample of five, so you, you can't make too many. Let, let's wait for more, more data, like you said, the ne next seminars and see if it balances out or not. But of course, it's unfortunately true that the field is severely biased. Yeah, so but one needs to actively work against that. Yeah. Well, it's a work in progress. Uh, I don't know if we have the capacity to get into the whole debate right now. Um, if anybody thinks have they have an opinion. I to say ab about this, because you said there, there are no females here because you don't know them. And I, I have the feeling that, um, at least in this data analysis sort of field, there is a bit of a, of a club that you belong to, well, the, the multiple clubs, that you either belong to or not. And, uh, for example, one of the clubs is, is sort of the, the open science, open source club, that I know many of, the, of my colleagues and the people I meet and I know are because I meet them mostly first on GitHub and most, like, I meet them through my open source sort of club. Um, and there, and, and I think we all have our own clubs, and sometimes we need to realize that because we are part of these clubs, we are also acting as gatekeepers to these clubs. So one, one of the ways we can actually uh, help a bit in this extent is to, well, when we are acting as gatekeepers to our little clubs that we, uh, we are part of, we make a constant effort to recruit more women and more other, other groups into them and maybe at least like actively, to actively overcome our own unconscious bias, so actively work at, at giving them a more of a push to pull them into our clubs. Because it is important here in academia which clubs you belong to. And we, we decide, we are part of that, those, that process and people that decide who gets to be in our club and are not. 
Thanks. Um, uh, we have to watch the time, so one last thing, uh, I'll raise it myself. Um, I'm interested, uh, you've talked about modeling the stimulus domain as a way to um, bring experiments more natural. Um, I'm also interested in the idea of models of um, the neural function at the level of the entire brain, of a human brain, um, which goes towards the theoretical idea of uh, what the brain is actually doing, which might be coming back around to Friston again, but I don't want to go that far. I want to think about the actual um, anatomical and functional and structural relationships uh, in the brain and, and what models of those might be becoming apparent in AI. So uh, I think Jan LeCun has, has proposed that this image recognition nets are somehow relevant to actual physical structural functioning of the brain in um, at least in ventral stream, so in, in the way that humans recognize images. That's a proposition of his, some uh, disagree with it, but um, others have taken that as a basis and, and gone further and said, what's missing from that? And one proposition is um, from Christopher Summerfield that uh, what's missing is that these image recognition nets do not do relation, abstract relational uh, coding. They don't know anything about the relationships between objects. They can recognize objects. They can ca classify for you a cow in a field very well. Um, if the cow happens to be sitting on a beach, they perform less well because they're not used to seeing cows on beaches. But um, they, they do well at object recognition, so they may be some sort of a, a, an analog of object recognition in the brain. Relational, abstract relational recognition is apparently, though, quite, quite absent. Uh, what do you think about this uh, idea of having a model uh, of, of brain structural functioning and how that might inform um, actual AI, so, so practical algorithms? I could start with Lowry, probably the anatomist in the room. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's done quite a bit nowadays. Um, and particularly in the context of using, when, when using um, more complex stimuli. Um, so one way to make sense of the stimuli is to apply these kind of models and then have some, um, I don't know, hypothetical uh, activation metric of each layer of a CNN, for example, and then you could try to correlate that with brain activity and then find the hierarchy of visual cortices, for example, and that kind of works. But, I mean, as you pointed out, there are differences. Uh, there are also differences in the structure because brain has, well, at least in some parts, there are 10 times more feedback connections than there are feed-forward connections. And this is not true with, with most of the uh, artificial neural networks. And that probably has implications on the, uh, how they are actually functioning. So, so doing very strict analogs between the uh, artificial neural nets and, and, and brain function, I, well, I don't think we should do that at this point. Then the other way is that we start from very sort of microscopic modeling and then of even starting from individual neurons and then trying to, to build very large scale models. But, um, and, and that's also useful for, for certain things. And I think we should try to sort of uh, make these two worlds to meet at some point. Didn't um, Henry Markham already try that? Well, he's trying this um, sort of bottom-up thing. And he's very strict on, on that things to be done in that way. That he has very detailed uh, models of, of single neurons and, and, and building cortical columns out of those. But it's more like a, really a sort of a bottom-up approach. Um, then if you have a very complex simulation or virtual brain circuit in that way, so we are kind of facing the same problem that it doesn't tell you too much about how the brain works because the model is as complicated as the object itself it's modeling. The good thing though with the models is that you can, you can measure them with infinite accuracy you can, and you can manipulate them as you like, which is very difficult with the real thing. So, so that, that's the power, but as such they don't tell you how the brain works. So you, in essence, disagree with Lecun and that's his baby, but he's, he's not... Well, I don't entirely do disagree. I'm sure that th there are a lot of commonalities. I mean, because it, it doesn't happen by accident that you get similar kind of hierarchies, but there are differences, as you, as you said. Others to comment? Well, um, if I can relate it to that. So um, I, I'm now shopping for Antti because he had to leave. 
but I'm sure he would uh, agree with this. There is a topmost question that is actually related to this. Uh, why should we assume simplified models tell us something about natural human behavior, which is assumedly complex? And now, um, should we then go to the way of very complicated brain models before we can say that we are now talking about natural human behavior? I think that the complicated brain models are useful for understanding how the brain works, but not necessarily for you understanding how human behavior or how humans behave. So Antti mentioned Herbert Simon and something that Simon wrote and that really works as a good principle for cognitive science is that human behavior is not complex. It's only apparently complex because it occurs in a complex environment. And what a cognitive scientist should do is to try to see beyond the apparent complexity and see the fairly simple rules that govern human behavior. And that's all that Antti was talking about. So if we are to model complex human behavior, we need to look into the minimal principles that can achieve this behavior, not to the most complex possible structure that could achieve it, but the minimal principles. Um, so, yeah. yeah. I could also comment here, the, the point you made about the uh, brain simulation, if it is as complex as the system you are trying to understand, it doesn't give you any real leverage and understanding, because it's unfortunate that we really only understand simple things, that's, that, that, that's unfortunate, uh, but that's how it is, and therefore your, your description of the, what the sim stimulus environment is should be simple, and also your model should be simple. If at the same time you want to understand real behavior, you have to have the right simplifications for the model and also for the stimuli, so that, that's why just having a simple stimulus is not enough uh, because if, if you just cho choose a simple stimulus, okay, this is something I can present, let's see how the brain, brain responds. Uh, that, that's different from uh, using um, sim simple stimuli that capture actually those things that you are trying to under understand about the real world. And that, that, that's that, that way, just by sim simplifying, uh, that doesn't solve the issue unless do you do the right simplification, which is what science is, I suppose. All right. With that, we have to wrap up, and they're gesticulating wildly at me from there to get off the stage. So thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody, for coming out today in this awful weather. And um, we'll see you all again in April. It's going to be probably the April the 3rd, and I will again spam the entirety of Helsinki with details on that. So till next time. <laughs>